Greetings, my esteemed audience. We are checking in from one of the greatest places in Spain. One of the greatest places in the world, even San Ildefonso. I have been here before, the last time in 2019, so perhaps you recognize the place from pictures I've posted. It pains me to say that this magnificent and magical place, it has deteriorated quite a bit since last time I was here. I encourage true Spanish patriots to take control of the situation and restore San Ildefonso to its former glory. Now, I will not dwell upon that. We'll get into the main topic of this fine video, which is, as you see in the title, European Gods and European Blood. But first, a message from the sponsor of this video. I am yet again sponsoring myself, and I will keep the message ever so brief. Do check out legiogloria.com. I am wearing the Oceanic Polo Shirt, organic cotton, proudly made in Poland. So do check it out, first link in the description box below. And now back to the topic at hand. So you can see before you this absolutely great place of pagan beauty. I talk about this in demigod mentality as well. I said this was a nominally Christian time, so this is built in the early 1700s, commissioned by the Spanish king, Philip V. Now, the gardens. We have to thank a sensitive Italian lady, an Italian lady of high culture and refined taste, Elizabeth Farnese. Now, you might recognize the name Farnese if you have watched the Borgias series. I can highly recommend it. It's great stuff. So, yes, it's the same family, the illustrious Farnese family of Italy. Anyway, she lived here as the Queen of Spain for a time, and she invited an Italian architect or a sculptor to create this uh, beautiful garden or the statues in the garden. So that is the connection right there. And of course, the interesting part is that you have in the um, in the supposedly Christian era, you still have these gods coming up. So our old European gods, they never went away. They were always with us. They are still with us. It feels great, mate. Now, on to the question at hand. Why do I, a sensitive Swedish gentleman, have an affinity with these Roman gods, or Greek gods, or other European gods? To answer this question, we need to go deep into European prehistory. Now, before getting into the bio-spiritual side of things, before getting that deep, we can also say something about the cultural relevance of these Roman statues. And that is, of course, that if you go to certain places in Sweden as well, I will show in the autumn, I will show in autumn the palace of Drottningholm, you will see the same style, the same aesthetic, and that is because European powers want to share the spirit of Rome, the spirit of high European civilization, so they sort of harken back to that time to create a sense of epicness and beauty, so that is a more a cultural thing. But now we're getting into the great and interesting prehistory of Europe. So as you perhaps already know, and I will make a separate video on this talking about the interconnectedness of European peoples. So basically you have three European population groups. The first one, hunter-gatherers, western hunter-gatherers, and you can sometimes see the woke lying media. They portray this gentlemen and fine ladies, they portray them as sub-Saharan Africans, but with blue eyes. I have talked about this before, so I'll just show a painting, a depiction here of what a Western hunter-gatherer male might have looked like, so still well within a European phenotype. Then came the Anatolian Neolithic farmers, and they could take over much of Europe, because they were there were so many of them, so they could take over. But eventually they mixed with these hunter-gatherers and they created a population group known as the Early European Farmers. And if you want to know what they might have looked like, you can have a look at modern-day Sardinians because they are a quite well-preserved group. So a mix of these two first groups, or, well, not first groups, but first groups in this particular story. So I'm simplifying greatly now, by the way. There is so much to say about this very fascinating topic. Those dominated Europe for a long time until the Aryans, the Indo-Europeans, came in from the steppes of modern-day Ukraine. And this is the most important group for our discussion here today. So when we're looking at all of these gods, we are looking at Aryan gods, and that can explain the similarity between 
myths, religion, religious attitudes, social attitudes, language as well. So if you know the Indo-European language family, you have of course Latin, Germanic, Slavic, Celtic, quite similar and then they have developed in different directions due to yeah the the nature of reality things develop same thing with the gods so when i feel a certain affinity with a roman god or a celtic god or a slavic god that is because they are related just as the languages are related so i have an easier time understanding latin languages so spanish for example i have an easier time understanding spanish than chinese so we are closer in that way and the main gods we have in europe they come from this aryan group or indo-european you can call it aryan is a bit of a controversial term ever since the second world war but i believe it's a better term because indo-european can be a bit misleading because then people think they came from india but the opposite is true they came from europe and they invaded iran and india and this by the way if you ever see me post about Indian gods or Iranian gods I still have a certain affinity with those gods as well because they originated in Europe the field of study is called comparative mythology extremely interesting stuff so in the 1800s many wise men in Europe they began to look at this stuff and said why do we find commonalities between Irish myth and Indian myth how can it be they are so far apart yet so similar in many ways in their heroic outlook on life then they started looking at languages we find commonalities between these languages separated by many miles and then lo and behold recent scientific developments we can actually look at DNA so we can see that the Aryan invasion theory of India, so the Aryans coming in to create the higher castes of India and creating that sort of culture and religion. Yes, it is now backed up by genetic studies. You can watch Survive the Jive's great video on the matter. So, to summarize my point, the origins of the gods, they originate with this particularly heroic and epic population group, the Aryans or the Proto-Indo-Europeans or whatever you want to refer to them as. Also, important point that, again, religions do develop and that is why we see during the Roman era, for example, you see many religious influences coming in from the East, primarily Christianity, but also things such as the cult of Isis coming straight from Egypt. Then we have the cult of Mithras, which I have talked about many times before. The Roman god Mithras, inspired by the Iranian god Mithra, both of them share the same Aryan origins. So famous rivalry, Rome and Persia, famous rivalry, Rome and the Germanic tribes, the Goths in particular, they all share the same Aryan roots. So Persians, Romans, Celts, Goths, among many others. Great stuff indeed. So it makes perfect sense for all true sons of Mother Europe to pay homage to Mithras or Mithra. There are of course many good European men who are Christians, so let me say a few things about Christianity. I will make a separate video soon about my thoughts on Christianity, but what I can say for now is that just as this Aryan religions, they developed in different directions, so even if Irish and Roman mythology or Nordic or Greek mythology, they have similarities, they are still distinct because they developed in different directions. Christianity also developed a lot and changed a lot over the course of history. So it began, as you all know, in Judea back in the day with Jesus Christ. Then when it came into contact with the, the greater world, the greater Greco-Roman world, it transformed to make it more appealing to non-Jews, basically. Then when Christianity came into contact with the warlike Germanic tribes of Europe, it transformed even more. And if you are interested in this, I can recommend a book titled The Germanization of Early Medieval Christianity by James C. Russell. I wrote a book review on it on my page. You can check it out. So, this is also something to keep in mind. If you are not an appreciator of Christianity, you have to keep in mind that many things you believe are Christian, they actually have their origins in European pagan religious tradition. So, anyway, my main point in this video, I hope you enjoy the video, enjoy my ramblings here and enjoy the nice footage. The main point is that all European peoples share blood. They are built up by these three population groups, 
So therefore it makes perfect sense that Europeans and Europeans worldwide of course have a certain affinity with the gods or even the culture of other Europeans. This by the way can also explain the religious tolerance of the Romans. Well they were tolerant with certain religions, they were tolerant with the other Europeans and the Egyptians to a certain extent, they were not as tolerant with the Carthaginians and the Judeans. So that's a topic for another time, but it can at least explain it that when they come into contact with other Aryan groups, they were more tolerant because they could identify more with their gods, even though by this stage they had developed in different directions so they translated Odin as Mercury for example and that translation is not perfect but uh, that's a topic for another time. Now some additional commentary on San Ildefonso. There you see me hugging a tree. Why on earth am I hugging a tree you might ask? Well perhaps the tree, perhaps there's a tree spirit there. Perhaps it needed a hug. It needed some love. It needed to be connected with something of high vibration and love. So therefore I thought it was reasonable. And there you see me going to a statue of the muses. Well, one of them at least. Trying to channel divine energy so I can have a creative autumn with a lot of videos, podcasts and writing and good stuff. So uh, absolutely beautiful place. I can't stress this enough. And now I will end this video with some bonus footage from the castle of Manzanares. You saw it perhaps in a real, a short video I made a while back so we went back there to get some nice footage from inside the castle so do enjoy that thanks for watching thank you for your support and i will see you in the next video xoxo boom